Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. On behalf of the SWA, welcome to the Williamsburg Conference. As Mian mentioned, this is the 39th, not the 39th in Singapore, of course. As far as I know, it's only the second time in Singapore. The Williamsburg Conference is an American invention after the town of Williamsburg created by David Rockefeller, who helped start the Asia Society, which are the main organizers. And it's a delight for the SWI and me to be their co-hosts here in Singapore. This Williamsburg Conference has been a stellar trans-Pacific dialogue among some of the key policymakers and thinkers about the important relationships between America and Asia, and of course, amongst Asians themselves. And I think that we meet today at a most important time in these complex relationships. There are many things happening here in Asia. And from what we read, there are also many things happening in America, some positive and some less so. And so the engagement with Asia is, to my mind, going through something of a change. And Asia itself is feeling a change. Part of it, a rise economically, but part of it, some of the tensions of growth and of emerging powers in our region. And so this is why the Singapore Institute of International Affairs is very happy that the Williamsburg chose to be in Singapore this year. I personally am very thankful for the Asia Society. I spent 2009... Uh, in New York at their headquarters. I'm very pleased to see friends like Jamie Metzl, the executive vice president, and others here. The Singapore Institute of International Affairs is Singapore's oldest think tank. It's slightly older than the uh, Williamsburg Conference. It's almost 50 years old. And we're Singapore's only independent think tank. That is to say, we run our own policies, though we know what the governments are thinking, or we try to know what they're thinking, if and sometimes they're thinking. We also are independent in the sense that we depend wholly on sponsors, foundations, and corporations. So let me, at this juncture, thank those who have helped bring the Williamsburg to Singapore. A number have always helped the Williamsburg, and I'll leave Jamie Metzl of the Asia Society to thank them. But particularly because it was held in Singapore, a number of corporates and foundations have helped, and they are the Hotel Capella, the Lee Foundation, which has been a long-term patron of the SWA for many years, Citibank and the CEO Michael Zink here, and two well-known Singaporean companies, Semcorp and Tomasi. Having thanked some people and thanking you, of course, for your time, please allow me to move on to that good old Asian tradition of apologies. Here, I must begin by a quite a sad announcement that our keynote speaker, Minister Giorgio is unable to be with us today. It's sad not only because we miss him on this occasion, but I think all the Singaporeans know that he has suffered a defeat in the Aljunit GRC, and with this, he will soon uh, have to step down as a member of parliament and under our system, but not some other systems. This will mean he can no longer be our foreign minister. Uh, Minister Yeo uh, explained that, of course, uh, he could technically be here, but he explained that, well, he did not need to explain, but I think things being as they are, uh, none of us were trying to press him to be here on this occasion. And I think it leaves many of the Singaporeans here with a kind of mixed feeling. Many people I know felt that having some opposition in Parliament is a good thing for Singapore on a national scale and for the long run, and they will create more stability, more accountability in our system. But almost everyone I met, and many more people out there in the internet have said that though this is a good development, we have paid a very high price for this in the loss of Giorgio as our foreign minister. Now, undoubtedly, those of us who know George and it's been my pleasure to know the minister for more than 20 years, uh, know that such a brilliant mind will not be completely lost to Singapore. There will be other avenues for his contribution. But it's a stark thing to see 
uh, such a good minister uh, be lost as foreign minister. I am told, however, that Singapore policy will remain much the same as it is. Of course, foreign policy always makes a matter who delivers the message, who thinks through the nuances. So Minister Yeo will be missed. But the cardinal points, cardinal directions of Singapore's policy, I think will remain quite consistent. The second apology I have is from the other side of the Pacific, and this is from the Assistant Secretary of State, Kurt Campbell. Again, a man I've known for many years. And uh, when I met him in October last year, he was persuaded to come. And until three days ago, he had a plane ticket uh, in his hand. Uh, unfortunately, the exigencies of US-China relations and his uh, 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 being on more or less a 24-hour call basis with Secretary of State Clinton uh, led him to postpone his trip. He, in fact, will be coming to Singapore next week. And while some of us will see him, unfortunately, it won't be in time for this since we can't possibly keep going in this hotel for a whole week. So I would like to apologize for both uh, these thinkers about Asia and America's relations. But while we'll miss those two, both today at this opening session and throughout the two days of discussion, closed door, I think we'll have an excellent uh, uh, group to lead us through some of the thinking about the uh, uh, issues facing both America and the region. We're going to have the panel discussion, and I'll introduce the panelists at that stage. Allow me at, at this juncture just to signal some of the issues that face U.S.-Asia relations. In the sense of there are already not just so many issues, but so many priorities. There's so many priorities like all competing for number one. Fundamentally, there is, as Asia looks at us, no single Asia. And so we've just had the U.S.-China third economic and strategic dialogue. And it seemed from the reports, this seemed to be in a better mood including on the economics and currency and excess of American companies to the markets there. But other questions, including human rights and the treatment of political dissidents, have been put on the table. And undoubtedly, the U.S.-China relationship will be one to watch for all of us, and not just if we are Chinese or American. Turning quickly in the other direction to South Asia, the welcome news that the Americans have achieved some degree of justice with the death of Osama bin Laden is rapidly being overshadowed by a kind of brewing uh, uh, storm, controversy, over U.S. relationships with Pakistan. And, of course, what happens with this relationship may well impact the ongoing campaign in Afghanistan and wider relations in South Asia. The third thing I see on the horizon is that we're coming up to the season of dialogues and fora which are led by ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, of which Singapore is strongly a member. If you recall the ASEAN Regional Forum held in June last year, the controversy of the South China Sea rose sharply, and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, I think, struck the absolutely right point that there were concerns, not only for the claimant states, but for others uh, concerned with freedom of navigation, uh, territorial disputes being settled peaceably. And since that time, we see other similar territorial and security concerns on the Korean Peninsula and in these rocks between Japan, China, and others. So we are coming up to a very uh, interesting time for dialogues about security. The fourth, and I should hurry up a bit, is that we are also coming to the time where America will start thinking even harder about how it will host the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. It will be held in Hawaii, the birthplace of uh, Obama, President Obama. And in connection to that hosting, America has also come on board the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as President Obama promised almost a year and a half ago, and is coming on board, has transformed this uh, uh, small trade negotiations 
among basically four members into something that can re-energize many more economies across the Pacific. And the fifth and last thing that really will be interesting about U.S.-Asia relations will be the East Asia Summit at the end of this year, where it will be the first time that America will take part together with Russia and join all the major countries and ASEAN here in Asia. Let me close my opening remarks by saying how much I welcome America to engage with us here in Asia. When we look at the world as we understand it since the end of World War II, there has been one power that has shaped the growth and laid the foundations of peace here in Asia. America has been the global and Pacific power. But against this background, we now see, it seems to me, some dark clouds domestically in America. In a recent visit I took to the East Coast, while unemployment has improved and stock markets seem slightly sharper, there are still many concerns about housing prices, deficits at the state level, and the looming national deficit. The future seems to some Americans to be questioned in terms of the growth and jobs, and a kind of mood of decline, a question mark over American predominance has arisen. We see in the political responses at the elections the rise of the Tea Party. We see some questions about whether America will have the will to address the deficit. And we see in the short term severe cuts on such essentials as teachers. But I would say to the Americans, both in the room and those of you who have friends in America, that I and certainly no one I know in Singapore writes off this profoundly uh, powerful country, powerful in the sense of its ideas, powerful in the sense of its sense of rejuvenation, powerful in the sense of its economic and political power. In the 70s, when it had inflation, in the 80s into the early 90s, when there was a called Japan threat, we saw America come back up. And I think we will be fools to write off America. And indeed, not just fools, but people who will miss a great opportunity to remain engaged, perhaps in a different way, a more multilateral way, with America. So with this, I hope I've explained to you why it is a great uh, uh, honor for us at the SWA to welcome the Williamsburg Conference and to engage in a debate about the future, the near term, but also the longer term future of how America and Asia should engage. Thank you all. I hope you enjoy this public session.